Our next presentation will be by Jared Goplin. Jared is a PhD student in the agronomy and agroecology at University of Minnesota. He's working on his PhD focusing on improving control of herbicide resistant giant ragweed by managing the weed seed bank. Jared is originally from Canby County, which he grew up and is still involved in the family farm raising corn, soybean, alfalfa, wheat, alongside a cow-calf herd. With that, I'd like to, for you to help me welcome Jared. Well, thank you for the introduction, and it's, uh, it's good to be here uh, representing uh, Minnesota here. Um, so I'll just kind of get started here. But So you've heard, uh, if any of you were at the last presentation, you, know, you kind of heard a little bit about herbicide resistance. You know, it's kind of on everybody's mind. It's certainly becoming a bigger issue. Um, so, you know, obviously there's been a number of weeds that have evolved resistance uh, to, to these herbicides. You know, that threatens, the, obviously, the herbicides for weed control since they're not going to be effective anymore. But, you know, also you think about some of these herbicide-resistant traits. You know, if you think about 2,4-D and dicamba-tolerant uh, crops, you know, if the weeds are already resistant to those products, those traits are essentially worthless. So it becomes very important to protect some of these, these products and it, it, it forces us to look at some of these other mechanisms to control these weeds. And just to give you an idea, you know, it's been estimated anywhere from 11 to $20 per acre in increased production costs with dealing with some of these resistant weeds. But, you know, you can obviously uh, imagine some scenarios where that, that cost would be significantly higher than that. So that brings us to the, the main question of how do we manage these resistant weeds? You know, obviously herbicides have been fairly effective in the past. You know, there might be another product that can, can help you out. But it, what it comes down to is we, we need to start looking at some of these other options. You know, something like tillage, or maybe even pulling out your old rotary hoe out of the, out of the shed or cultivator. And then ultimately, you know, if we become that desperate, you know, it might come down to hand weeding. But I guess if it was up to me, I'd just as soon cultivate instead of hand weed. There's also these things that I'll refer to as cultural practices. And they, they include things that you see listed on the screen. So things like row spacing, planting date, you know, crop rotation, you know, try to manage that weed seed bank. And then also, you know, if you're, you're planting annual crops, maybe think about uh, incorporating a perennial like alfalfa. You know, and these are all things that aren't going to necessarily, you know, directly kill the weeds, but they're going to at least help improve control by suppressing the, the weeds in some way. So for the sake of today's talk, I'm going to kind of focus on these bottom ones. And the, the weed I'm going to kind of use as, a, as a, an example is giant ragweed, since that's... Uh, that's one of the weeds I've been dealing with for uh, some of my research and is uh, becoming a very big problem in Minnesota. So those of you familiar, uh, you know, giant ragweed has been a, a pretty significant uh, agricultural weed for quite some time. It's very highly adapted to corn and soybean systems. Uh, it tends to be difficult to control with pre-emerge herbicides because it emerges really early in the growing season, typically before you're planting or those pre's are going on. And then also it's very large seeded. If you see the, the photo on the right here, you can see it's about the same size as a soybean seed, uh, which allows it to emerge up to six inches in the soil, kind of puts it out of that herbicide band and, and makes it a little more difficult to control. Giant ragweed also has developed resistance to multiple herbicides, uh, as you might have saw in one of the last presentations. On Wisconsin, I know it's resistant to both ALS and glyphosate independently, but in Minnesota we have multiple resistant uh, plants, meaning uh, we have resistance to both ALS and glyphosate in the same plant. And these, uh, these resistant species are becoming quite widespread across Minnesota and, and the greater Midwest. So this, this figure here just kind of shows you and reminds us, you know, the life cycle of annual weeds. So for all annual weeds, you start from that weed seed bank. That seed will germinate, emerge, and if that weed is able to, to progress through the growing season, produces viable seed and starts that cycle all over again. So for, for the research we did, we were interested in how crop rotation can influence some of these, these aspects of the seed bank. So uh, referring to both the seed bank degradation and then also the emergence patterns to see how crop rotation can affect these. And then look at both of those and, and see how they can maybe help improve our weed control. So the study took place uh, down in southeast Minnesota by Rochester. And at the location, we had a farmer that was having significant difficulty controlling giant ragweed. And it turned out it was resi resistant to both glyphosate and ALS, so we established this crop rotation uh, research there. And the next couple of pictures here are going to show you uh, kind of the level of resistance that we're dealing with. 
So the beginning of June, we went in and applied the labeled rate of glyphosate on the left and untreated on the right. And you can see there was a little bit of suppression of the giant ragweed, uh, but certainly not uh, acceptable control. And if you take a look at uh, ALS uh, for the, this, this figure or this picture, we used first rate. And you can see once again on the, the left picture uh, that ALS really isn't doing a whole lot compared to the untreated on the right. So a very significant level of resistance in this population. And I should just also mention that the pictures were actually taking place right next to each other. So for this study, we had six different crop rotations that I have listed in the, the graph here, or the, the table. And they're all fairly common to the Midwest. So you have continuous corn, uh, variations on a corn soybean rotation. Uh, the fourth incorporates wheat into that rotation, spring wheat. And the fifth is uh, atypical uh, rotation, uh, where we just have a single year of alfalfa in a corn and soybean system. But we wanted to see if just even a single year of alfalfa might have an effect on some of these weeds. And then the sixth is uh, two years of alfalfa followed by corn. So just you know, short three-year rotations just to see if we can see any uh, differences in that short period of time. Uh, since we did have resistant weeds, uh, we did plant uh, corn and soybean, uh, or uh, Liberty Link corn and soybeans, uh, just to, to control those weeds. And if we did have weed escapes, we maintained a, what we call a zero weed threshold, meaning no weeds were allowed to go to seed, so we're able to get a better understanding of the weed seed bank degradation. So here I'll come back to this figure, and just to, to kind of give you an idea, we're going to start talking about the seed bank degradation. So what's happening kind of below ground. So there's a few ways that we can degrade the weed seed bank, and this really goes for all weed species. So the first and easiest to think about is emergence. If you're going to have that, if that seed's going to emerge, obviously it's leaving that seed bank and it's not going to be a problem in the future. But then we all ha also have these other things that you can't really see, which include things like seed predators, so some rodents or, or birds that might be eating the seeds and, and removing them. And then we also have uh, soil microbes that are breaking down the seeds. So stuff like bacteria or fungi, some of the same microbes that are breaking down your crop residue are also going to be having an effect on, on the weed seeds. Uh, previous research has shown that uh, crop rotation can increase this activity of microbes and therefore increase uh, seed degradation. So we're in really interested to see if crop rotation uh, might have an effect on this. So to study the seed bank, basically what we did is we went in in the first year and the third year, just took soil samples and counted the weed seeds in, in those soil samples. And this graph here uh, shows you the crop rotation treatment on the x-axis and the uh, percentage of the giant ragweed emerged on the y-axis. Uh, and this, this is uh, showing the depletion for giant ragweed. And as you can see, you know, there's a very high level of seed bank depletion in just two years. So between year one and year three of that crop rotation. And there was no differences between any of the treatments like we thought there might be. And overall, there's 96% seed bank depletion in just two years, which we, were, we thought was you know, pretty significant. And really what that tells us is if we can intensively manage this system for just two years, you can see a very high level of seed bank depletion in a short period of time. Now that extra 4% might continue to, to cause problems, you know, but at least you're getting a start somewhere. Uh, one of the interesting things we did notice with these different crop rotations is that, like I mentioned previously, one of the ways you can de degrade the seed bank is through emergence. Now these blue, blue bars that I'll just add on top of the orange ones show you the percent of that depletion that was due to emergence. And you can see in those first three treatments, you know, almost 100% of that depletion was due to emergence in the corn and soybean rotations. So, like I said before, you know, giant ragweed is very adapted to corn and soybean systems, so it isn't really surprising that we're seeing very high amounts of, of emergence in that system, or in those systems. But then if you look at some of these more diverse rotations, so the ones that have wheat or alfalfa for either a single or two years, you can see about 60 to 70% of that uh, depletion was due to emergence in the alfalfa and wheat rotations, the, the annual rotations. But that two years of alfalfa really suppressed uh, emergence, and only about 41% of that depletion was due to emergence, which tells us, you know, there's some of these other factors that are playing roles, like microbes, or it could be, you know, some other way that this seed bank is being degraded. Another, another example of, of how this could be occurring is through just seedling mortality. So it could be, you know, with the differences in tillage in that alfalfa system, you know, there's less tillage, could be a little more compacted soil, um, and it could be that those seeds are germinating but aren't able to emerge due to, to reasons such as that. So to really summarize and put this into words, if you're able to maintain a zero weed threshold, at least for giant ragweed, you know, you're going to see 96% seed bank depletion in just two years in any of the crop rotations. 
But, you know, the, the million dollar question is, well, how in the heck do you maintain a zero weed threshold, right? So one of the examples I'll, kind of, I'll continue to go into is, is planting alfalfa. So now, coming back to this figure, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about emergence and, and how crop rotation had an effect on emergence. So this figure here, once again, has a crop rotation on the x-axis, but now the y-axis is going to be seedlings per square meter. And basically, this just shows you the total emergence of giant ragweed in the second year of these rotations. So in year two, you know, you had, we had the most uh, diversity in the crops that were out there. So we had all four crops that were in our rotations. So it just gives you a really good example of what we saw for total emergence in these systems. And the two treatments that really stick out here are the second one, this corn that was planted into the soybean stubble had the greatest emergence, which is, is something important and you should probably keep in mind, especially if you're dealing with, with giant ragweed, telling us that, you know, some of the soil environmental differences, you know, soil residue uh, could be having an effect here. So when you plant corn into the soybean stubble, we saw more emergence. So, so something just to maybe keep in mind and be ready for. The other treatment that really sticks out is that last treatment, and that's the, two year, this, the second year of alfalfa. So in established alfalfa, we saw significant reductions in giant ragweed emergence, which also isn't that surprising because, you know, this is a true perennial system, so you're not going to have, or that giant ragweed isn't very uh, evolved for that type of system, so it's really suppressing that, that emergence. So just to put that into words as well, once again, that corn planted into the soybean stubble had the greatest emergence. And in that alfalfa, established alfalfa treatment, we saw five to 13 times less emergence in that treatment than any of the other, other crop rotations. And this, the weeds that do emerge, you know, aren't as big of a deal because, you know, just with your regular cutting schedule, you're gonna be able to clip those plants off and prevent any weed seed production uh, just through your regular harvest schedule. There's also a number of other benefits to planting alfalfa. So along with these crop rotations that we had for the, the study, we also took crop yields and uh, all, monitored all the crop inputs and outputs of the system. And using the average prices received in Minnesota for, for all these crops in 2012 to 2015, you know, so you can see the prices listed here underneath the, the graph, but so about four and a half dollars for corn, 1177 for beans, 640 for wheat, and $166 a ton for alfalfa. Uh, this is our, our average re net yearly income or net returns. So we have the, the crop rotation on the x-axis and then the dollars per acre per year on the y-axis. And you can see on the far left that, that two years of alfalfa followed by corn, you know, even in the last four years with quite high commodity prices, we still had the, the greatest net, net yearly re returns. But, you know, really the last four years is quite a bit different than what we're looking at for prices currently. So I, what I did is just took the same, same crop yields that we got uh, over the last four years and just used current crop prices. So I took the national price index from last week. Uh, so 327 for corn, 811 for soybeans, 463 for wheat, and $120 a ton for alfalfa. And you can see, you know, with these these more current or realistic prices, that alfalfa treatment is still still the the obvious winner with with in terms of uh, average net returns per year. You know, coming in at around $70 per acre per year. And one of the reasons for this is that you know, in that corn following the alfalfa, so we followed. University of Minnesota recommendations, which says that, you know, you shouldn't need any additional nitrogen application, you know, which saves, you know, close to $100 per acre, and that's one of the reasons why we saw that better net return. So as we move forward in some of these, you know, a little bit tighter uh, system, you know, where we're going to have to monitor some of these inputs, you know, certainly alfalfa could be a, a viable option. And also, if you're dealing with some resistant populations, you know, especially in soybean systems, it's, it's very difficult to control and it might be increasing your production costs even further in that soybean or corn systems. So really what it comes down to, you know, if you're someone who grows alfalfa or some of your, your, your clients grow alfalfa, you might want to think about planting it in fields that you, you're having trouble controlling weeds with. You know, it's more competitive, you have less reliance on herbicides. Um, but, you know, what, what if you don't grow alfalfa or what about the years where you're not in alfalfa, then what do you do? So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about emergence patterns and how you can maybe uh, change your timing of some of your field operations to try and improve, improve control. So basically in the same study, we documented uh, the, the emergence timing as well. And across all the treatments, this shows you uh, basically what giant ragweed emergence looked like. So you have the date of the year on the x-axis and then the percent emerged on the y-axis. And uh, where you see this arrow or, or the percentage on top of the bars just shows you the cumulative emergence. So you can see 
at least for giant ragweed, it emerges very early, beginning of May, peaks uh, around the middle of May or towards the end, and tapers off. So one of the things you can think about in terms of improving control is, you know, rather than having that early planting date like you, you maybe would like to, think about delaying, uh, delaying planting even a couple of weeks just to allow a little bit more of that giant ragweed to come up. And then if you're, if you're going to go through with a, a passive tillage or, uh, or a burn down application, you, know, you can just uh, hit more of those giant ragweed plants that are emerging earlier. And specific to tillage, uh, there's really no effect that tillage has on emergence, so it's not going to stimulate any additional emergence, so you can feel you know, pretty good about, uh, about your control with tillage. You know, but then the other trade-off is, is crop yield. So you want to have an earlier planting date so you can achieve you know, your maximum crop yield. So basically what this red line here that I just added shows you the percentage of, of your maximum soybean yield on average. So obviously with your earlier planting date, you're going to achieve about 100% of your yield potential. And as you delay that planting date, you're going to lose some of that yield potential. With the earlier planting date, you might have a little bit more variability in that yield, you know, just depending on weather events. But for the most part, uh, that's when you're going to see your greatest, uh, greatest yields. And just to go through with that May 28th example, so if you're going to wait till May 28th you know, to go through and with a pass of tillage before planting, you're going to get about 77% of the giant ragweed is going to be controlled with that tillage. And you're only going to lose about 92 or 8% uh, of your crop yield. So, you know, just kind of start to weigh some of the, the costs and benefits of, of some of this timing, uh, or how, how timing can, can help you out a little bit. Also, with a, with a delayed uh, planting date, you're going to have a little bit better crop emergence, which, which is going to allow that to be a little more competitive with, with some of the weeds that you're dealing with. So, now I'll start to uh, summarize a little bit and kind of bring this, this all together with some of the other weeds that you might be dealing with. So what does this mean in terms of integrated weed management? Well, I like to think of it kind of as a game of percentages. You know, how much do you want to rely on your herbicides? You know, as you may have seen some of the previous presentations, as these weeds become more resistant, those herbicides aren't going to be as effective. So you might not want to rely on those quite as heavily as, as in the past. So just to continue and go through uh, the example I gave you before, you know, rather than having that earlier planting date, you know, even if you have a relatively effective pre, you know, by the time that pre wears off, you're still going to have quite a bit of ragweed to deal with, or other weeds for that matter. But if you think about delaying the planting just a little bit, go through with a passive tillage or, or an effective burn down before planting, you know, by the time your pre is wearing off, you're only going to have to deal with 5 to 10% of the, of the giant ragweed at least after that date and time. And then in terms of your post applications, you know, rather than having to follow that planting date with an early post pa uh, pass, you can also delay that post application a little bit. And you're going to have to deal with less, less weeds, and then they're probably going to be more uniform in height, so it's going to be a little bit better control with those later post applications. And also, you know, certainly if you want to incorporate cultivation or some other practices, they'd be effective as well. You know, but then, all right, so it's not quite that simple. If everyone just had giant ragweed to deal with, you probably wouldn't have jobs. So what does this mean with some of these other weeds? So just a couple other common ones, uh, like water hemp or, or lamb's quarters. You know, so the shading here shows you kind of when they're going to be emerging and what this later planting date might mean for some of these other weeds. So now, you know, those post applications that were delayed might do a little bit better job on controlling, especially your late emerging water hemp or maybe your later emerging lamb's quarters. So they might be a little bit more effective on some of these other weed species. And then also in terms of your pre, you know, if you had that earlier planting date, your pre is probably not going to do a whole lot on that late emerging water hemp. But if you delay that date, even a week or two, you're going to extend that, that residual activity a little bit longer and might get a little bit better control for some of these other weeds as well. So take home message, if you can intensively manage, prevent any weed seed inputs for two years, at least with giant ragweed, you're going to see 96% depletion. And for some other weed species, it might be a little bit longer, but uh, certainly somewhere to start. How do you maintain that? Uh, well, one mechanism is through crop rotation. We saw fewer weed escapes in the alfalfa. Uh, there's, it, there's less total emergence, and it's more competitive. Your harvest schedule is going to eliminate any seed production. Uh, I didn't really talk about wheat much, but you can use different sites of action, specifically the, the growth regulators that are, that are more effective at controlling at least giant ragweed. You can also alter planting date in your corn and soybean systems. You know, just even a week or so, you know, maybe wait. If you have one field that's really bad with a certain weed, you know, just leave that field till last or something. Even that extra few days can really help con improve control. Uh, so with that, uh, hopefully I didn't go too far over. No, you're not over at all. Perfect. Any, any questions?